Hello, everybody. Welcome. I'm Lee Van Horn. I'm the Dean of the College of Public Service. Happy to be here with you. Um, Stephen Villano, where are you, Stephen? Stephen Villano, the director of our Center for Public Service and Community Research, asked me to give you a little history of this and make an introduction. So I'm here to do that with pleasure, and then I'll join you. In 2015, in the College of Public Service, we created a speaker series we called Vital Voices. Our idea was to engage students, staff, faculty, and our community partners in interactive discussions with key individuals in the field of criminal justice, social work, and urban education. Those are the academic disciplines that are in our college. Um, I remember that we set ourselves a goal of having one event per semester. Well, the response to Vital Voices has been tremendous. In 2017-2018, we will have eight events, an average of one a month during the full semesters. We've learned a great deal through these interactions with people in our professional fields, and we're putting what we've learned into action in the college. Tonight is the inaugural, the very first, the one and only, never will happen again, uh, <laughs> uh, event of our vital alumni series. We see vital alumni as a way to connect our current students with our alumni from the College of Public Service who through their professional and personal mission are demonstrating their dedication to serve others and to changing the lives of those they serve. With vital alumni, we are bringing you alumni who are making a difference. We want to show you where the others who once walked these halls have gone and what they're doing. We want to challenge you to see yourself beside them as you make a difference in the professions of criminal justice, social work, and urban education. Now, here with us tonight to introduce a very vital alumni of the College of Public Service and the University of Houston downtown is our very vital President Juan Sanchez Munoz. <laughs> oh. Clap for him now, then I'm going to say some more things, and then you can clap for him again. President Munoz brings a new energy and connectivity to UHD. He is clearly committed to the people of our university and the people of our communities. President Munoz is one who exemplifies genuine concern for others and a willingness to work hard to find what needs to be done to positively impact our community and then to give us the tools to do that. Our president challenges all of us to find new ways of working and ways of making a difference. Here he is, President Munoz. Thank you, Dean Van Horn. I'm, I'm not nearly as prepared as she is. She had notes. And uh, uh, I want to just say a few words, and I'll introduce my friend, Sheriff Gonzalez. I can't tell you how thrilled I am just to, to, to welcome all of you and uh, our vital alumni series for a couple of reasons. Uh, first of all, I'm a tenured faculty member in the college, so, uh, so, my so the dean is my boss, and, uh, and uh, Dr. Beebe as well, so I report to quite a few people in the building, and, uh, and all of you, and, uh, but uh, I tell you, and don't say this to the rest of the university, this, is, uh, this, this college has my favorite name, but don't, don't, don't tell anybody else that. Uh, you know, think about it, uh, the College of Public Service, College of Service. I mean, think about what that obligates us to. Uh, in my mind, uh, there's no greater calling. You know, when I was a teacher, uh, a colleague of mine used to say, you know, metal workers, electricians, they deal with these kinds of hard materials. Yeah. Teachers deal with hard materials, fragile materials, transformative materials, the humanity of students. This is what law enforcement, criminal justice, this is what we deal with. And the consequences couldn't be more substantial. And so in service, there's something very selfless about saying, I want to be in a department in a college of service. There's selflessness and there's sacrifice. And when I, a personal friend of mine, Attorney General Alberto Gonzalez, first Hispanic to be Attorney General of our country from Houston, talked to me about seeing his mom and his dad and his mom prepare little burritos in a brown bag for her dad who went off to work every morning in construction. And when he was about to be sworn in 
as attorney general how his mom came to Washington and made him the same breakfast <laughs> that his dad had had growing up in Houston, being of service. And I remember him telling me that on that morning of 9-11, and they didn't understand the, 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 the degree of assault, of attack, and what was happening. He said, I learned that morning as well that leadership and service can sometimes be lonely. And so you have to have that kind of resolve and understanding of what it is that you've obligated yourself to, to serve, to serve others in this role, in her role as dean, as a faculty, as a department chair, and as a sheriff. Now, Sheriff Gonzalez was one of the very first people I met here as an alumni, he was so kind and generous and so proud of being a UHD graduate. And then we had a chance to, in my mind, do something very sacred that comes all the way back to the Mexicanada, to the indigenousness, okay, to break bread, to share a meal. And he told me about where he grew up. And he told me about his familia. And he told me about the familiarity with the neighborhood and about being a police officer and about wanting to be of greater service on the city council and then wanting to be of his current service as sheriff, where literally millions rely on his judgment and decision-making for their safety. For my safety, my wife's safety, my boy's safety, your safety. And sometimes it's hard work. And I saw him, and I tell you this, I couldn't be more proud. I couldn't be more proud of my friend the sheriff. I couldn't be more proud of his family, of his family, that helped shape this character and integrity, this selflessness, this UHD graduate, as I saw him time and time again on television during the worst of the storm, trying to inspire those who faced such difficulty. Okay. This is what this college, a college of service, a university of service, produces. This caliber of public servant, you out there, your caliber, of servant. And I just tell you, I'm so proud to be a part of this college, part of this university, and part of this talk. Talk about a vital voice. You'll hear no more vital than my friend, our colleague, our alumni, Sheriff Gonzalez. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Munoz, uh, my friend. Man, he said it just like I wrote it, right? I mean, it's fantastic. <laughs> I feel like stand-up comedy up in here. <laughs> uh, but uh, Dean, thank you, and to all the students, everyone here, to the cadets, uh, good seeing you. I saw you out there doing some PT. I remember those days when, uh, many years ago, <laughs> uh, many pounds uh, lighter uh, when I was with the Houston Police Department starting out my career many years ago. Uh, but it's truly an honor and a privilege, I, I sincerely say that, to be here uh, once again on campus as a proud alumni. Um, Adriana Perez that works on my team is also an alumni so very glad that she's here and uh, other members of our team are here as well like Alfred and Jake so thank you for your service to the sheriff's office every day as well but uh, Dr. Munoz kind of laid it out perfectly uh, my passion my interest early on was in to serve others I wanted to make a difference and didn't know what that was going to look like I just knew that's what I wanted to do uh, going into the future and I'd be remiss not to start kind of just briefly a little bit on how I got to U of H downtown because I think it frames a lot of, of the rest of my journey, uh, the second half of my life so far. But grew up very close to, to campus here. Uh, we lived here in the near north side. My mom operated a small business for many years. We lived on Bishop Street. If you take Maine, you intersect with, with Bishop just past uh, Hogan and Quitman and all that. So maybe to two miles, two, three miles from campus. Remember this building very well at a distance. I remember it was a brewery uh, right down that, not, not the modern, uh, what's the, what's the, yeah, not St. Arnold's. It was, a, it was another one. It was a, a Jack's, I think. But uh, anyway, uh, I remember the location here before it was UHD. It was a hotel. You know, I remember that. that I'm dating myself quite a bit. But, uh, but anyway, I, I didn't know what I was to do, but Something very interesting happened when I was about six years old. And I found out then that my dad couldn't read and write. And that was very impactful to me because, frankly, quite honestly, growing up, I was embarrassed. I was embarrassed, like, oh, my God, everybody else's father can read and write. My dad can't. 
he must be dumb or could never, I don't know what it's like for my dad to ever read a, a story to me or anything like that. But I did see his unconditional love. He passed away uh, almost 20 years ago. Saw his unconditional love as a parent, instilling hard work and values to me. He was a blue collar worker and he used to help him out as he went looking for jobs. He was a welder, uh, self-taught and uh, got to help him and would have to read the menu for him and street signs and different things like that. So to this day, I'm an avid reader. I don't even use uh, um, uh, spell check, honestly, because I could kind of spell check as I go. I I'm try to be meticulous about that just because I, I developed an early uh, you know, passion for reading and, and became an avid reader, uh, maybe because I had to help him. Uh, and so both he, him and my parents, uh, my mom worked very hard, established her small business. It grew. They were able to, between that and my dad's hard work, provide for the family. And so, again, they instilled those values early on right here real close to, to campus. So I'm very grateful for that. So while, like any family, we had our dysfunctions and our issues, again, they, they taught me early on that I could achieve and do whatever I wanted. And so I always believed in myself. I believed in that, even if the things around me, you know, were not reflective of that, you know, gang activity and other things. I often say that if you look at statistics, I would be more likely to be incarcerated in the county jail than I ever would be to be the sheriff. You know, it's a, it's, if you look statistically, that's what it says. But, but uh, I'm very blessed, and, and, and I don't take that for granted. But uh, graduating from, from high school and, and, you know, through those years, again, I didn't really know what I, ha what I wanted to do. Uh, I didn't have a mentor, per se, and uh, I, I strongly recommend that because sometimes others that have come before us can pave the way or kind of give you some direction. So as much as I can, I try to help out and, and, and offer some direction where I can, whether it be one of our team members at the sheriff's office. And you'll, of, you'll often hear me say team members, not my employees or my workers or anything like that. Uh, but um, I think that's important. So I didn't really kind of know what to do. My parents had never been to college. No one in my family had been to college. So uh, UH downtown became an option for me. And it's one that I came. I, I tried to figure it all out by myself, and, and I liked it. I liked the feel for the campus. It was smaller. Uh, it, it was diverse, uh, at, even at that time. And, uh, and I decided to come and, and pursue a career in criminal justice uh, because linking it back to what I said about helping others. Because what I learned early on by my dad not being able to read and write is I, I learned something that to this day still, still guides me somewhat, and that's that Sometimes people need a navigator, whether it be to navigate a complex legal system, an attorney perhaps, or a criminal justice system that's complex, law enforcement. Sometimes you need some to help navigate abuse and other dysfunction, social workers. You need different folks to help navigate, and you do it without judgment uh, because we haven't walked in that person's shoes. Just like I had to do it for my dad without judgment and know you know what, it wasn't that he was dumb. It was just that he didn't have the opportunity because of the poverty in his family to be able to enjoy going to grade school and having his dad read to him and doing those things. So I want to break those cycles, but sometimes we have to recognize that people need navigators in life. So I didn't know where that was going to take me, so I came here to UH downtown, started taking courses and excited to be in college. And... Lo and behold, I met a Houston police officer sitting in one of my classrooms. I still remember he was in uniform. Uh, I think it was on the south side of the campus, uh, you know, and uh, we were in class. And, and it, the aha moment kind of came. I said, I think that's what I want to do. Why? Because he took an interest in me and encouraged me. Oh, sh you should apply. You should look into it. And so that's what I – but, you know, funny, I, I thought of early on about maybe being an architect. I thought about an architect, a lawyer, some of, some of those professions. But I didn't have somebody guiding me in that. I wasn't, math was not my favorite subject. <laughs> and, and so, and I thought, oh, you need too much math for that. I didn't have somebody to kind of guide me down that way. So it's always important who you surround yourself with because uh, you're only going to be as successful as those people around you are sometimes. But he was an early uh, mentor of mine. He guided me towards the police department and, you know, started my career with the Houston Police Department. Initially, I started as a civilian, went on and became a classified officer went through the academy and started working in very important positions from missing persons, juvenile division, family violence. Uh, I, I went on and uh, worked on patrol, 
uh, work patrol many years as well to get that sense of street enforcement and, and everything that comes with answering calls for service in a very busy district in our city. I also, uh, my dream job at the point at that time was I want to be a homicide detective. There's no higher crime than murder. So worked hard. I prepared myself and uh, was able to get selected to serve in the, in the homicide division and worked there for many years as a homicide investigator, worked a lot of, you know, some of the ugliest, most horrendous crimes that, that you know, our city faces, you know. Uh, was also uh, able to promote um, through the promotion process of taking courses and testing and all of that. Was able to promote and also was selected to be on our hostage negotiation team. And to me, that was a big accomplishment because they only had a class every two years and yet hundreds of applicants and they only picked about 20 of them. So I was very happy to be selected to that and receive the kind of training and, and experience that you get in that role. And so um, I, I, I still had a thirst and interest in pursuing higher education. So even then, even though I had moved on and now I had an established career with the Houston Police Department, and I knew I had a career track, it's never, to me, success goes to the committed learner. And so I wanted to continue to learn. I didn't want to say, oh, check, check the box off. I got a, a bachelor's in criminal justice. I wanted to do more. So uh, didn't come here for the master's. At, at the time, I don't think they had a big selection or even had a master's level program. So I went to University of St. Thomas and I got a master's degree there. Also enjoyed the, the instruction there. And always tried to keep learning and bettering myself. Uh, became a, a member of a, a American Leadership Forum, Leadership Houston, and programs like that. I was very active in the community. Why? Because you know, I have a public servant's heart. Not only was I out serving in my professional career, but also serving in my extra time as well. And uh, was able to, uh, to, to still have that interest in, in, in helping and wanting to do more. And I feel that my career here, my, my time here, not my career, but my time here, my education, it really prepared me for that because it helped provide a foundation. My learning here helped me provide a foundation that then I and now you can build upon. Because you don't know what it looks like. You, you know, if you go and you lay a slab somewhere, you see the slab, you may see kind of the shape of what's going to go up there, but you don't really know the, 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 the other amenities and things, how it's going it's to be a skyscraper that people are going to just admire forever, or will it just be a simple place, you know? And, and so that's something that I knew I could shape, and I was going to use that foundation to build something better. And I always had that. I, I, to me... Again, other, and I'm trying to just sprinkle different things because then I want to kind of take questions, see what may have been of interest to you. So, you know, I'm, I'm trying to just throw different things at you. To me, whether I was pursuing my career with the Houston Police Department or whatever would come after, and I'll touch on that a little bit, were two things. There's an important part in one's life, and that's the time, well, the parts, uh, when you're born and when you die. You know, and, and, and when our time is over, and my time is over, there's going to be a grave site somewhere, just like my dad has less than a mile here at Hollywood Cemetery. And there's the day you were born and the day you, you died. But the most important piece is from that old poem or story that's been written that's well known, that what matters most is that dash between there. What was the dash? What did it say about you? What's your legacy? You know, and I wanted at an early age to make it matter. I wanted, to make a, I wanted to make a difference. Just like when I was a student signature, didn't know what that difference was going to be, but I wanted to make it count. And so, so to, to this day, that's something that, that always sticks with me. The other was um, that I want to die on empty. You know, I do. I want to die on empty. The I don't want anything left in the gas tank. Not because I'm exhausted and tired, even though some days I am. And my, and my team will say, Sheriff, what were you doing at dispatch at midnight, you know? You know, what were you doing out on patrol or out directing, you know, because I went down empty. I, whatever gifts and talents I might have, even if it's just simply helping somebody else or encourage one of my team members, then I want to do it. I want to do it because we'll only walk this way but once, you know? And so I wanted it. I wanted to make a difference. So... So going back a little bit, I was with the Houston Police Department, and even, even then I still felt like this is great, love public service, love law enforcement, I'm giving a great deal, but I still felt I could do something better. And it wasn't uh, to look down on my, my chosen profession, I just felt I could still offer a little bit more. 
And so I made the decision to leave the career that I loved and to seek elective office and to represent the area where I was born and raised in the near north side. And then we did move a little bit towards the heights later on when it wasn't the trendy heights that it is now. Uh, but I like to point out that when my parents moved there, uh, they paid $30,000 for their home, okay? That's for the lot, which is one of the deep lots in the Heights, plus the home and everything. So it does definitely worth a lot more than that now. But, uh, but and, and, and so, you know, so, so from there, I still wanted to offer more. So I ran for elective office, and I was able to win my first run at political office, which was the district age city council. And I served there for the full three terms that I could serve. And I was really uh, afforded a wonderful opportunity because coming in as a rookie council member, I was selected by my peers to serve as then vice mayor pro tem, which in the ranking you had the mayor, then the mayor pro tem, and then vice mayor. So I came in as a rookie, never having even, well, I served the first six months because I came in, in a special election, but my first start, the first six months after, I got appointed and by the by the mayor and then uh, by my peers as, as vice mayor pro tem. So I got to sit in a lot of high-level meetings with the mayor's administration. Soon after the mayor pro tem stepped down, I was elevated, elevated to mayor pro tem, and I served the remainder of my term on city council, basically all six years as mayor pro tem for our city. So it gave me a unique perspective of my hometown, not only at the district council le uh, level, which I represented, areas like Independence Heights, uh, Denver Harbor, the Heights, uh, near North Side, all the way up north, Little York area, some of those parts. And le taught, learned a lot about customer service, some of the lessons I learned early on from my mom being a small business owner, all those things we're, we're able to put them together and learn about, you know, that moment of truth. You know, when people call our office and they, they maybe they've never called you before, don't remember if they voted for you or not, but they're calling you and they need help. And on that day, you better deliver. You know, because that's what they're going to remember, is that you deliver for them or not. And so, you know, stressing those kind of lessons and, and other business principles, ideas, management, and what have you. So, served there. I served as chair of the Public Safety and Homeland Security Committee, which is, again, very helpful to me to apply my, my law enforcement perspective and help shape policy. I helped create um, our police stations at being sites where you could go for, for online transactions instead of doing them. We've had a lot of crime that happened with people now online. Built, you know, business is a big thing. So we opened, not, not open, but we allowed our stations to be used as meeting locations so there could be safer transactions. I created the, uh, the Houston Sobering Center. And probably my, my most thing I'm most proud of on city council was, thank you, yeah. Um, it's, uh, it's a, this is what kind of started shaping a lot of the public policies. The reason I was saying that I think I could do more is, I was putting people in jail and I'm and working in, in homicide. We were, you know, I have people still that are in death row. I mean, on serious, the most serious crimes there are. But I was wondering, what else can I do to shape public policy in a different direction? You know, what can we do to prevent some of this from happening, not only afterwards? And so, help create the sobering center. We used to arrest about 12,000 people every year for public intoxication. Sometimes it could be a college student, it could be a business person or someone else. Now, with this, we no longer incarcerate you. We could go and take you, you sleep it off for a few hours. For those of you that may, may remember the show Andy Griffith, we call it the old Andy Griffith model. We just let them go, sleep it off for a few hours, and they get to go home and, and move on. It doesn't create a criminal record. We save millions of dollars that we could redirect to other law enforcement uses. And, uh, and we have better outcomes because we connect them with a recovery coach, uh, somebody that could help them deal with the addiction. And so very proud of that. And also very close to here, uh, my last few months on city council, the last project I delivered that's also up there with the Sobering Center, it was, I, was, I was very happy to deliver the uh, Cafe College Houston. Dr. Munoz has visited. It's amazing, isn't it? It really is. It's a, a one-stop shop where any student could go anywhere from the city and get free information on, on college uh, applications, doing your FAFSA, doing you know, some counseling, whatever you need, open six days a week. So it's a free service that's available there. Uh, build a collaboration with Project Grad and others. So I learned about team building and collaboration, all those kinds of things. And so very proud of that. And it's very close to here. And, uh, you know, we're excited for your support, Dr. Munoz and U of H downtown. I know there's a lot of things that could be done there. And, and we hope to expand that, that uh, 
services into other areas as well because the, the demand is definitely there. And so uh, when my time on, on council ended, I had the opportunity then to decide another station in life to say, what do I want to do now with the rest of my life? And I, I still missed my chosen profession, which had been in law enforcement, everything I had learned here. You know, I missed that part of it. Even though I was in the public policy side, and had it ended there, I could have been saying, wow, what a ride. You know, got to grow up in a humble community, humble beginnings, go serve a good career with the Houston Police Department, serve on city council, mayor pro tem, travel to many places of the world from Israel to South Korea to Japan, China, you know, all these different places. Like, wow, you know, it's a good ride. But what did I say? I wanted to die on empty, you know? And I still feel, I'm still relatively young. You're supposed to nod, yes, right? Yeah. <laughs> and so, uh, but, but so I wanted to, to still give more. And I felt that I still had a lot to give. And, uh, and so, you know, uh, so then that's when the opportunity came up where it, when they, uh, the former sheriff, personal friend of mine, Sheriff Garcia, had stepped down uh, from the sheriff's office. And it had created an opening. And there was an interim sheriff, and so I had the opportunity to then run for what then was still a, a, technically a vacancy because there had just been an interim uh, sheriff that was appointed to fill out the term, and then it was going to be open. So decided to go back and serve because, again, it combined in many ways my passions of public service, law enforcement. It was kind of the perfect thing. And so it just meshed both worlds really well. And so, um, you know, was able to run. Uh, it's very daunting even though I was a seasoned campaigner and had won tough races before uh, my first race for for city council had uh, eight other I think eight other opponents and so it was very competitive so so I had that I was battle tested in that regard and uh, it's one thing when you're first going to run because you're saying what you're going to do and then people don't really know but now I had a track record so to speak through city council to say these are some things that I had accomplished and um, and so I was able to run, and then I won my election. I won it in November. Um, and in fact, you know, we had a debate here that happened uh, right before the election, I think maybe about a month out. So uh, it, was, it was great to participate in that. And so I won, and like, wow, what, a, what, a, what an amazing feeling. And, uh, you know, it saddens me that my dad's not around anymore. And uh, it saddens me also that my other cheerleader, my, my mom, uh, uh, is suffering from dementia and had no clue that her son had just won, you know, the sheriff's race. But that's life. Uh, it's the curves that life uh, throws at you sometimes. Uh, but I know that they would both be tremendously proud, you know, of the work that, that the way they raised me, you know, because I, I'm indebted to them uh, for giving me that upbringing. Um, and so I was able to win that race for sheriff and to put it in context of how big it is, is that, uh, you know, when you were mentioning some, I was at an event recently, and, and, and they were saying, and next we have, man, this guy has a huge responsibility, it was actually a commissioner, he, this guy's responsible for 4.1 million people's safety, and, and I was like, wow, that's kind of impressive, I didn't realize they were talking about me, you know, <laughs> I, I really didn't, I just, I was just, it, I didn't connect the dots, and sometimes, you know, one of the things is, I'm a real simple person, at, at the core, I'm just a humble public servant. I really, really am. I'm not, my staff will tell you, I'm not high maintenance. I'm, I'm not a diva by any means. They're always telling me, just the other day, it's like, what are you doing walking down the street talking to the, my staff members, my, my team members? And I'm just like out there, you know, directing traffic over the Lake Houston Parkway and whatever, whatever it takes, you know, because that's just the way I was born. And I still remember that humble man and my dad that couldn't read and write. And so I'm always, I still talk to the, janitorial people, you know, I never want to forget where I came from, and that's something that I hope I always, you know, that always sticks with me, that I stay grounded that way, but, you know, was able, again, to, to win, and, and then, uh, you know, hit the ground running, um, you know, we, we have a huge budget, but going back real quick, I'm sorry, to put it in context, it's the largest sheriff's office in the state of Texas, the third largest in the country, and so to run that kind of operation with 4,700 employees under uh, my responsibility as well for their well-being. We house over 8,000 inmates on any given day right, right across the street over here. Uh, and then the geography of 1,700 square miles over 33 cities. 
that fall under our purview. And I'm so blessed to have a great team uh, around me, not only immediate, my immediate command staff, but also the rest, the, the, those that are the boots on the ground serving every single day. And, um, but we've been able to hit the ground running, tackle a lot of different issues from making sure that we're on track with our budget. That's always a very important. We've been able to, 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 to honor some of the step increases, which are some pay increases for some of our employees that hadn't been, those hadn't been honored for a little while, so we wanted to make sure we, we got those in place again. So, so we wanted to do that. Uh, we had to uh, stabilize the budget a little bit because when I came in, we were spending about a million dollars every two weeks on overtime. So we were able to reduce that significantly uh, by almost half, you know. So it took a lot of work by our team. Uh, we were, when I came in, we were outsourcing approximately 400 inmates to private prisons uh, at a very high cost. Your cost, it's not mine, uh, ours collectively. And then, and then um, so we reduced that. Uh, within two, three months, we got it down to zero. Now, I will say we've had to outsource a few more. Uh, again, because we had stopped for months, but it was due to Harvey, uh, because we we had to logistics, and we had, to, and they're not inmates of ours anymore. They were they're state ready. They're ready. They've gotten their sentence, and we're just waiting for the state to come get them. So we just moved them out to a private prison so they could go and pick up from there just for logistics purposes, but not because we're in need. And so, and also uh, tackled something that's been controversial, but I personally believe in, and that's bail reform. You know, I got involved with that issue. There's a, a current lawsuit going on. Uh, um, and, and the basic premise is that uh, bail should not be dependent on, on cash only. Uh, we should, it should be risk-based uh, because if you're poor or you have limited means, uh, it should not be simply if you can pay a fine or, or, or get out based on if you have means because that means if you have money, which is great, and you committed a crime, you could bond out. If you commit the same crime, but you're poor, guess what? You don't get, you, you don't get out. And so it should be based on risk, not based on if you can only pay for that. And so trying to change that system. So there's a current case. You may want to follow that a little bit. It's a very important, impactful decision. The judge did rule in favor of reform on this temporary order right now. So we are able to move forward with some reforms that have been significant. Um, there's always inherent risk with anybody that's been incarcerated, but we also believe in second chances. And even if we didn't, and even if you don't, it's still a costly system that you're paying for. And if it were effective, that's fine. But in this country, we spend $80 billion a year incarcerating people, and that didn't include all the costs. It just includes just uh, incarceration. It doesn't include uh, judges, police, or anything. And we still have crime. You know? So we have to rethink how we operate. And remember what I said about the sobering center? is creating different models. That's all we're asking for, it's just more tools. Is if somebody uh, has a drug issue, you know what, assign them or give them drug treatment. You know, if, if somebody's homeless, then find a different program where we could accomplish what we're trying to accomplish without incarcerating. Because in that population that I just mentioned across the street over there, 25% of our inmates, your inmates, uh, are um, on one type of psychotropic medication at least. That's very costly. That means there's some mental issue. And not through me, it's through, we have a mental staff over there that does these assessments, 25%. Uh, we have 75% on average are pretrial detainees, meaning they've yet to even go to court and resolve their issue. They're just, they, they're not able to bond out because they're too poor, there's mental issues or other things happening. So 75%, that's a pretty high number. And so, there's other ways to assess and address that, that population. Because you create a stigma with arrest, you're breaking up homes with arrest. And you know what, I'm all about law and order. Remember what I said about, we have, I have people in death row for crimes they committed that I investigate. So it's not about that. I believe in accountability. If you break the law, you need to be accountable. That's how I learned, that's what I was taught. So we're not talking about that we're, we're you know, taking it easy or being soft on crime. It's the contrary. I, I want to be better stewards of the money you give us so that we can redeploy and go after violent criminals that are burglarizing our homes while we're here in school or our businesses or, you know, or something's going on. And statistics tell me that those that are exiting the state prison system, within 36 months, 75% are going to reoffend. They're going to reoffend. We know that. I don't want it to be you. I don't want you to be leaving class or going to the ATM on the way home or your loved one son, daughter, somebody, and somebody puts a gun to their head or, or their knife, a knife because 
it's, they're on that 36 month, that stigma of nobody wants to hire them, nobody wants to rent to them, and guess what? They're going to commit another crime. That's why they end up going back into, through the county, back into the prison system. Those with mental illness, if they're not competent to stand trial, I, I house them here for an average of, remember, they haven't been charged with it, they just are, you know, crazy or mental issues, about three months. It's because there's limited space at the state for, for mental services. So I've got to hold them here for about three months. I send them to the state for another three months. How long now? Six months. Maybe on a charge of criminal trespassing, nonviolent misdemeanor. So what happens after that? They send them back, say, all right, he's restored. That comes before just says, well, you've already served six months, so we're going to send you back out. What happens again? They get unstable again. We had one guy that we identified that was in there for trespassing, 83-year-old man. We ended up finding out that the issue is that he's got dementia. So he's disoriented. He's, you know, just walking around, gets lost. Police don't know what to do with him. They end up incarcerating him for trespassing. See, law enforcement nowadays is being charged with doing a number of things that, in my opinion, we should not be at the front end of it. We should be on the back end. And that's addiction, mental illness, and poverty-related issues. And to me, those are things that should be dealt with out in the community by community-based organizations. We could have a role in that. But, you know, if they have addiction, we're not going to solve it in the jail. Only we're paying for it, $75 a day on average, if not more, if they have a psychotropic medication, because sometimes there's dual diagnosis, but there's addiction, mental illness that's, that leads to addiction, or addictions that eventually lead to other, you know, schizophrenia, other things. If, if they're on one or two medications, you're talking hundreds of dollars a day. So it's not like it's for free. We just don't see it because it's behind closed doors. You know, you see them when they're out here walking around sometimes, you know, but we've got to find other ways. The jail system should not be the, the first entry point, you know, and so these are issues that we tackle on. It's only been nine months, so be patient. We'll get through it, you know, and then things happen like Harvey, you know, and, and I was uh, very happy to be out there working with, uh, with the men and women serving the sheriff's office. I, First day out, I was doing rescues. I was in water almost to my neck, and uh, we were able to rescue people, and, and I was on a kayak and all kinds of crazy things. Uh, but, uh, you know, I do it in a heartbeat to serve my hometown, and, 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 and now through the recovery, there's a lot of areas that are impacted in 1,700 square miles that we represent. So we're still out there assisting, you know, and we try to. It was an amazing uh, experience to go through, um, you know, being soaking wet, uh, you know, being out there doing rescues and then at the end of even coming back to stay here on our complex and trying to keep the morale up of our detention officers, uh, making sure that, you know, inmates were taken care of. The, the jail was on the brink of, of collapse, not physical, but just systems were starting to go down and you have eight, the 8,500 inmates there. It's all these things that we have to lead. We have to solve problems real time. It's not a perfect science sometimes, but you use all the experience that dating back to the classroom here you know, all the way through city council and law enforcement, things that we've seen over the years and the team around you. And so, you know, we're, uh, we're doing well, and, and uh, a lot of our employees were, were impacted, so we're trying to get them some help as well because there they are helping others while they themselves are being hurt. So, uh, and, and so, in a nutshell, that's kind of how I got here is still that vision of, of serving others, and I'll probably do that the rest of my, my, my life, hopefully. And uh, I must say that it was very cool, not, very cool not only to be here now, but, but one of my highlights was uh, being a commencement speaker uh, for U of H downtown several years ago. And again, to, to think, wow, you know, I was in a classroom and now in front of this big crowd of parents, everybody, and giving a commencement speech was pretty amazing. And going back, I, I thought for a moment before taking the, 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 st the stage that, uh, you know, thought of my dad. Again, not able to read and write, but you know, amazing country that we live in and, and uh, the way things work out that he was able to raise a son that, that not only could read but could at least offer some remarks in a commencement speech. To me, that's pretty special, you know. And so um, that's, where, uh, that's where we're at right now. So I don't want to just keep talking because I could talk about a lot of different things. And, <laughs> and, uh, but I'll pause there for a second just to kind of get some thoughts uh, from you or any questions about the yeah. issue. Yeah. Talked about the importance of having to navigate throughout your life, and I was kind of always curious about what kind of navigation did you receive when you were trying to decide, and then ultimately did 
make that transition from police to political office? Could you, you make your two successful large global Good question. Um, you know, once I uh, once I got into the police department, um, you know, I, I started making a lot of friends, you know, and and uh, and developing professional friendships, and and again, my, my goals were first internal to the organization as far as how do I keep advancing, keep growing, um, and and thinking outside the box, you know, because I wanted to be a homicide investigator, but if I looked at our own academy, you have limited course selection. So I thought, you know what, let me go to outside agencies and go take courses. So when I went and applied for homicide, I, I by far was the, the best and the brightest. And, I, and another thing, I, I'm very humble, you know, so you won't hear me say, oh, look at me. Am I right? Or, <laughs> they have to say that. <laughs> they have to say that. <laughs> no, no, but, but I say that to say this, is that I say it be, that I'm the best and brightest because I was the most prepared. Remember what I said, I was the goes, success goes to the commit, committed learner? I went and took other courses. So when I went and said, wow, you have dead baby investigation, you have skeletal death investigation, you have that I took in other academies, nobody else had shown that initiative. So I, I, I was able to, to get into those positions, and, and I'm so proud that I served as a homicide detective. So I segued a little bit. But I met a, a good friend of mine, a then police officer, uh, Adrian Garcia, as I mentioned, and kind of helped mentor me, uh, kind of, he was very community oriented as well, so we kind of had that, sh we just, it's funny because we've so followed similar paths in life, but it's not like on purpose, it's just, we come from the same neighborhood, uh, similar families, both served the police department independently, met there, we worked together, uh, you know, in various capacities, mainly uh, what we call extra jobs, so it's our extra duty, you know, off-duty jobs, moonlighting some people call. And so just developed a real close friendship and, and, and saw his passion for, for community uh, engagement. And so when he ran off and, and ran for city council, I was involved. And, and I got to see what it was, and I got that bug. And getting involved in the political process, I really got the bug. Cause, and, and, and so I got to all, work all aspects of campaigning. And I liked it and I enjoyed it. And then when, when he moved on, it, left us, it was a perfect fit because I grew up in the area. You know, I felt I had a good resume and background to offer the community or be a good choice, and I got elected. And, you know, again, he, he ran for sheriff and he left. And so there was never any, like, hey, I want you to run for my, it just fit. It just landed perfectly, you know, for me. And, and you know, in hindsight, I don't know if he would have left. Now it didn't, was the outcome he wanted, obviously, but, but it was a blessing for me in that regard. And, but it's not ever about what, no matter who your mentor is or no matter who helps you, you still have to pay your dues. You still have to do the work. I still have to earn it every single day to this day. I don't say, hey, I won, I'm sheriff, and, and let me do my victory lap. You know, I still try to earn that moment of truth where people expect deliverables, and I have to deliver on that every day. You know, I'm sheriff 24-7. I can't turn it off and even if I'm not at work or even if I'm, I'm away on travel, something, there's always a crisis. There's always something happening. And so you still have to have the, you still have to bring the goods, you know. And, and it doesn't matter if my mentor was the former sheriff or a previous sheriff or whoever. You still have to, to prepare yourself. So when those moments, I always say, I can't tell you what doors are going to open in the future, but if you're that committed learner and you're prepared, you're going to have a number of doors you could choose from. Others only have one. Others never have it because... My dad didn't have, he could never advance because he couldn't read and write. So how many doors is he going to have compared to somebody with a bachelor's and a master's? And, you know, I mean, so I created a lot of those opportunities as well. It's a long answer, sorry. So, yes. So in the courts, the courts decided to reverse upon the judgment that they put on the ASB board. Where do you stand upon it and how do you, how do you plan on enforcing that So Yeah, well, I mean, you know, uh, he's talking about SB4. Uh, the, there's a... The, the court has paused it. It's kind of an immigration law that the state of Texas passed and the legislature. Um, I personally am not in favor of it because I feel that law enforce, local law enforcement is, is tasked with doing local law enforcement type priorities. My, my priorities that I could see on the county by being out there, I, I'm a hands-on sheriff. I'm going to be out in the community and, and I want to hear what people are concerned about, you know, the burglaries, the robberies and all that. There's already cooperation that happens if anybody commits a crime that you know, it's zero tolerance. We're going to arrest you. I don't care where you're from or what your status. You committed a crime. You know, there's already in laws that are there. 
but we're not federal authorities. We, didn't, we don't study and prepare no tax law and immigration law. It's very complex. Somebody's status, how long they've been here, you know, are they in the, you know, are they a resident and all these things. So what it allows is that our law enforcement officers can ask if somebody's under lawful detention, you know, immigration status, you know. And so in the past, we didn't do that. We had more of a jail-based program that it's after somebody got arrested. But to your point, I don't pass the laws. There's laws I don't like, just like there's laws I support. And I can't support the judge's order on one hand that I support and believe in and, this, and not, not follow through with another one that I don't like. You know, that's not my role. I have to follow the law. The law says that. And all it says, it doesn't mandate that an officer will do that. It just says that they, they have the discretion now. Now, what that's going to look like, we don't know. We also can guard against racial profiling, so that's one of my priorities, to make sure that our processes are firmed up, to make sure that they don't allow for racial profiling, because that's not allowed in SB4. Technically, you know, we know that things could happen, so we want to be mindful of that we're watching the numbers, and if we see those patterns happening, because that's not permitted through SB4. We're working local with the different advocate groups as best as possible to, to be supportive and make sure that, um, that, uh, that, that we, we, we run c consistency with other partner agencies like, like HPD and others so that there's not different policies all throughout. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, if you don't mind me asking, I think um, one of the things that's kind of most interesting that you mentioned very early on was that you started out at HPD as a civilian. And I think um, for a lot of CJ students in the audience, or other students even, you know, one of the things that I think we try to hit home as faculty is that, you know, you have to get in and then kind of move up. So just out of curiosity, can, did you, mind, do you mind sharing what it is that you did as your very first Yeah, job? one of the first things I did because, you know, again, I, I wanted to kind of get my foot in the door, and that's, I knew I wanted to, so I, I became a police service officer, and it was a support role within the Houston Police Department, and uh, it was a civilian position, and you still did a lot of functions, actually, that a law enforcement does. You just weren't certified yet, and so was able to do that, and, and then I got in there. I liked it, and I applied for the classified position, so I got in that, got in the academy, passed, and I went on. Uh, you know, and serve. So there are different entry points. We are a large employer of, of UHD graduates. I was talking to the dean, and she's got some of those numbers, but we hire a lot of UHD alumni. In our floor as well, I, I mentioned Adriana in my office, but we have many others uh, that, that are, are UHD graduates. Uh, many start off with us as detention officers. Uh, one thing we weren't doing uh, before I came in is we had really stopped recognizing those that were TECO certified uh, that may have come from the, the academy. So we've now honored their TECO certification. So we uh, elevated them to detention deputies. So they wear the same uniform. They're deputies. And so, uh, and now we're, we're graduating some of those that, that, that fit our criteria, the gateways that we apply so they could go out and patrol if they want to do that. We want to create advancement and opportunities. Um, and so that's what we, we try to do. So we're still, and we're talking about what we could do to work with UHD downtown with your vision, Dr. Munoz, and, and yours, Dean, to see uh, continuing learning for some of our uh, our team members as well, not just that, just to improve their skill set. Maybe there's little things that they could learn to to make them better uh, at what they do and, and and create more opportunities for themselves and their families. It's not a question, but I work for the sheriff's office. You do? Yeah. Yeah. You work now? Mm -hmm. Okay. Say some good stuff, please. <laughs> <laughs> Where do you work at? No, no, no. I'm in the graduate program right now, okay. and a couple months ago I wrote you a letter asking permission for the 100 Club scholarship program to pay for my yeah. tuition. You signed off on it, and I just want to tell you thank you for giving me the opportunity. I remember those letters because it touches me for, for a number of reasons. One is it's UHD. In this case, uh, you're advancing your education and and uh, that's something again that I remember my parents instilling in me and so I'm very pro-education uh, and uh, and so I commend you for that and, and we hope that we could use that skill set at the sheriff's office as well and in, in some capacity I, um, uh, I, I try to be very accessible and, and if we could ever help you personally you know uh, you know we're there to help you get to the next level whatever whatever it is your dreams are 
we'll take maybe two more. We'll see one here. Um, what would you say to uh, these wonderful young ladies that are here from the criminal justice uh, study, um, to encourage them to seek a position in the criminal justice or something like that? For the, for the women here in the room? Uh, I'm very pro women. I mean, uh, I, uh, yeah, right. <laughs> No, uh, look, uh, the strongest role model I had around me was my mom, you know, my, my mom was the boss of the house, I mean, she was, you know, and, and uh, she, 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 uh, she was a force of nature, she was a trailblazer, like I said, she had her own business, you know, and she didn't have, she had a little bit more education than my dad did, but formal education, but she had a vision and wanted to start her beauty salon and opened it, became very successful here in the near north side, so I was never intimidated by a successful woman or, you know, I, I just, it's, it, you know, I, I, my, my, I keep picking on my staff, but, but I, they'll tell you, I, I, I'm very much about getting them involved and going out there to stuff. And, uh, Adriana, for example, went out on a homicide scene with me the other day. She liked seeing that stuff. I don't know, but, but, but yeah, but, but, you know, I, I believe in that, but that's at a very minor level, but, but, um, uh, you know, the other thing for me is when I came in, I wanted to increase diversity. Uh, and so uh, I, I elevated the first female assistant chief ever in the history of the sheriff's office on my command staff. And so uh, very proud of her. Um, and, and so we've tried to do that not only in our command staff to have women, uh, but one of the early things, haven't done it yet, it's been nine months, be patient, like I said. But, but I talked to my staff, my team early on, about doing a women in leadership, a women in law enforcement conference, because, because, and I've said this to my team in in private conversations. That it's great that, like, you take some something like like narcotics. It tends to be very male oriented, and we think of men all the time, and we should. You know, nothing against the men. You know, they they deserve opportunity like anybody else. But women, we tend not to think they're tactical or, or they can handle their own. And I. Having been through, um, I'm sure the ladies in this do PT just like the men can. And men, I'm sure y'all would say they hold their own. And, and you become a, a, a unit, a team. And, and so we're all one, you know. And, and that's something I always want to convey. I don't know what role you work, sir, but, but if it's DOs or if you work in the jail or you're not on the line, I, I stress it a lot. We're one team, you know. But back to, to women, it's like they too should be afforded the same opportunities to, to promote, to seek opportunities in homicide and narcotics and all of those op those places and and uh, and I want to create a, a kind of a mentorship program so that they can one of the captains that we have now actually she's the first I think she's the first yeah the first african-american captain that was ever promote female promoted in the sheriff's office she was already on the list to be promoted so she earned that on her own it just happened to be when I came in but but she's she's the first in all the history the first female captain, you know, not even the chief, just a captain. So, uh, you know, we come a long way as an agency. And, and so part of it is how do we get more opportunities? And she had said that when she was a young officer, a deputy, that she thought about quitting because she was a single mom with a child, the stresses of the job. It just, you know, it's tough. And she thought, maybe it's not for me. You know, I'm not being a mom. And, you know, it's a male-dominated profession. So she found a mentor and somebody to help guide her here now fast forward and she's being promoted to one of the highest ranks which is captain so that's pretty impressive and so we want to support women in law enforcement so that they're not afraid of the profession when i was with city council we struggled that uh, there were only two percent women in the fire department very male dominated profession and 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 so you know we got to change that you know we got to break some of those if you're qualified and it shouldn't just be given to anybody everybody should earn it men or women but it's 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 something that we want to promote one more um, I've been a fan of yours since you're running in the election, oh, when you. I met, it was also a very controversial bill being proposed, and uh, you supported um, Prop 1, no, um, and even more so when I found out you served on the board at the Houston Area Women's Center, um, and I, so I just wanted to uh, hear more about Sure. Yeah, social justice issues are just very important to me because I just believe that that everybody deserves opportunity, and and uh, it doesn't matter your sexual orientation, your your 
your culture, your background, where you come from. I just believe in humanity. And I believe that, uh, that going back maybe to that public service, early on as a police officer, we learned to serve everybody. You know, when somebody calls for help, you don't, when we were saving people, it was African American, Asian, Latino, you couldn't, you didn't know their sexual orientation. You just were there to help, and they were there to get help. And it was so touchy. That was so, I've had so many stories of people coming down. We've had so much help from across the country coming here, and they, it's a common theme was like, wow, Houston's different. They're unique here. Like, people help one another. You know, and you saw the, the response of law enforcement. I'm proud of the sheriff's office response. I think we did well. Not perfect. This was a thousand-year event. We hope it's a thousand-year event and not <laughs> more every two, ten years like it seems to be. But, but, but that humanity here that, that's here. But I think that, that going back to what I said early on, that, that I learned to be a navigator without passing judgment. You know, and if we have one form of discrimination against one, then, then um, uh, it's discrimination against others. And it's just like my dad had the limitation of not being able to read and write self-imposed or because his family couldn't provide that for him, why were you going to impose other limitations on other people and their happiness or their, their, their right to succeed? And, and I just don't feel comfortable being the one to say, well, you're not as worthy as I am because you're different. And I learned through my graduate studies about how we view the others. And, and I love international relations. I love foreign policy. You could have interesting debates and discussion of, about that is, is maybe because of my upbringing the lens I see the world, maybe I view you a certain way because of all that, but really you're not that different. It's just that I've been raised up with a certain dogma, a certain religion, a certain thing that tells me this is how I should define you. These are the stereotypes that fit. If I were to sit up here and tell you, those that may not know my, my political background or anything, if, if I were to tell you, if we, we could have a great conversation and about anything in life. The moment if you ask me, well, what's your political party? And I tell you, if I tell you I'm Republican, you're going to form a certain name. Oh, you're this, you're this, you're that. If I tell you I'm a Democrat, oh, well, you're liberal, this and this and that. You're soft on ground, all these things without getting to know me as a person. So I gave you the long answer, but that's, to me, it's like I just believe in, in, in people in general. Well, I, I commend you for being one of the first to come out and support that. Uh, Thank you. I appreciate that. And um, maybe it's a shameless plug. I don't know if it is, but I'm very active on social media. Uh, I, I do. No, I say it, but, but because it's, it's, I say it not to promote. Back to what I said. It's not about self-promotion. But I say it this. I, I, just last night, I was helping someone that was complaining because she's like, well, I don't know where to go to the, I don't know where to file a report with the sheriff's office. And I started responding to her directly. And I said, well, you need to do this, this, and that. And, and, okay, well, I don't know, it, it's far from my house, and I don't, if I need to go and meet you myself to make sure it gets taken care of, I'll do it. So, so I, I try to engage a lot. So I'm telling, if you care to follow me, just, you know, please feel free because I try to be helpful and give information. And, uh, but it's, uh, it's uh, uh, Sheriff Ed underscore HCSO. Um, it's Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook should be Ed Gonzalez Houston, but I manage it myself, my own personal accounts. I don't have somebody else doing my account. We do have one for the sheriff. That's the sheriff one that is run by, by others. Uh, but, but my own personal one, it, it's me engaging and stuff. And we did a, an interesting exercise through all this storm of, of so, uh, law enforcement on social media. And, and, and we were helping with some rescues and different things all through social media, getting help, coordinating things. So it was an amazing experience to go through that so all right so thank you all very much and
I'd love to take a picture with some of you and, and post it. Yes. You know, <laughs> Thank you. 